Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about um, Mimetics. Um, Mimetics is a regenerative medicine biopharma company um, based in Atlanta that is, has a mission of developing um, innovative birth tissue um, technologies that enable healing. And the portfolio that we have um, in, the, in the market now include um, a placental tissue portfolio that, that has um, amniotic tissue that modulates inflammation, reduces scar tissue formation, and enhances healing. Also, an, some umbilical cord products that provide protective environment for healing and also a, lo, a high level of hyaluronic acid that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and then the placental disc as well, which can be mixed with, it's, a, it's collagen based and it can be mixed with um, other components of the, um, the placenta or of the umbilical cord or both in order to um, provide um, a protective environment and replace or supplement um, damaged um, or inadequate integumental tissue. Um, we also have some amniotic fluid um, products as well that protect and cushion and provide lubrication um, as well as reducing inflammation. Um, what differentiates, um, there are a number of amniocorion companies um, out there, and what differentiates Mimetics is the purion process, which is, is um, a process in which um, the layers of the amniocorion are separated, and, and there's a special cleansing process with multiple reagents, um, and then it's relaminated back together. And the importance of this is really that um, a lot of the bioactivity is maintained as well as the structural integrity. Um, so basically, these are from um, C-sections, either planned or sometimes they're emergency sections if, if we, our recovery team can be there in an appropriate time frame. Um, so these are live births, and um, after some serologic and microbial testing, the amnion chorion or umbilical cord or both are harvested, and then this process is, is, um, takes place at our facility in um, Marietta, Georgia, outside of Atlanta. Um, and then these are obviously shipped out and marketed. And, and these are... Um, these allographs are now described actually in a USP um, monograph. And it, it actually does matter. So the, the way that the tissue is processed um, does allow, as I said, biological and structural integrity. Um, the process is very, very consistent um, from one, one lot to another. Um, it does confer a five-year shelf life. Um, we do store it at ambient um, temperatures and, and ship as well, which is very helpful. Um, and the terminal steril sterilization provides an added level of um, safety. We've had over, uh, over a million of these graphs have been distributed with, with um, negligible um, adverse reactions. So the human amnion chorionis, it looks as you might expect, um, has a lot of collagen 4 and collagen 1 um, associated with it, as well as some hyaluronic acid, um, lots more in the cord, which I'll show you. Um, and there are cells, these cells are not living, um, so the process does in fact kill the cells, um, and it, it does also um, confer that added um, bit of immunoprivilege, um, although we haven't seen any immune type reactions to this tissue. Um, and you can see there, when you overlay um, the, the way that the tissue kind of comes together in the two layers, um, and the typical extracellular matrix proteins of fibronectin, hyaluronic acid, um, heparin sulfate, proteoglycans, and laminin are, are of course present. Um, interestingly, though, I think are what the factors that are actually in the material, um, many of which preserve their bioactivity, and I'll show you some data on that. Um, in, a, in an, an antibody array, a quantibody array that has um, 600 wells, 600 potential um, answers to your query, um, over 500 proteins were identified in um, this, what we call DHACM, which I think is a horrible acronym. Um, but um, I look for a hairball when I hear that acronym. But uh, <laughs> the, um, So 285 of those in that list, and I'm sure if we looked for more, we'd find more, but 285 are regulatory proteins, so things like growth factors and chemokines and, and immunomodulators. And the others in that list are uh, membrane-bound proteins like surface antigens and receptors. And as the cells are not living, we're not really sure what the relevance of those are, but I think the 285 regulatory proteins are, are interesting, um, and in many cases, those are proteins that can um, drive target cells in the area where the tissue is put to um, have cell proliferation, migration, and signaling, and, and we have a lot of data and some publications that, that demonstrate that, and um, presumably this then leads to the repair and regeneration that we see. And this is unfortunate that this was an animated and slide, and I didn't realize until right before that this had, the animation had kind of been ruined. So I'll just talk you through it. Um, so Epifix is, is the flagship product. It's the, um, the laminated amnion chorion. And this is, you can see the, the list of publications there um, that have been published from um, our labs and other labs showing that um, Epifix, when, when um, 
has, when cells, it reaches cells, um, causes proliferation, migration, and biosynthesis. I have a lot of data on that, so I obviously can't show all of that. It's in these, these papers. We also, this is, um, we usually use, use human dermal fibroblasts because, I'll, as I'll show you, this really has um, sprung up most useful in the wound, chronic wound market. Um, so I'll show you a little bit more about that. So human dermal fibroblasts were used first, and then also there are some publications from our labs on um, hematopoietic stem cells, um, adipose-derived stem cells, both in healthy and um, type 1 and 2 diabetic patients, which actually have a blunted response, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, and these cells, and also... Um, bone marrow-derived uh, stem cells, and, and we see proliferation, migration, and biosynthesis in all of these cell types. We're just now starting to work, not on this slide yet, with tenocytes, um, which we think is sort of interesting, and, and chondrocytes as well as we move more into sports med and ortho. Um, so maybe next year I can show you some of that. Um, and in multiple animal studies, we have seen stem cell recruitment, including a parabiosis model that was published with um, Dr. Gertner. And, um, and angiogenesis in, in multiple in vivo studies. So it's some very interesting effects, um, interesting bioactivity that is preserved. This is then um, the cord. Um, we have an epicord and amniocord, which just differ in, in what endothelial layers are present, um, but otherwise um, essentially the same. Um, the histologic analysis shows a lot of loose organization from the Wharton's jelly that is preserved in the cord, which has a, a, a abundance of hyaluronic acid, um, even more so than just the amnion chorion, and obviously type 1 collagen and, um, and cells too, and the cells again are non-viable here. And this similarly has an even worse acronym, <laughs> but this is, um, the, this is what the, the pie chart of the protein composition looks like. There have been 241 regulatory proteins that have been identified, um, a large number of which are sort of growth factor cytokines and other soluble regulators, so there is quite a bit of activity in the cord as well. Um, and this is um, a little bit hard to see, but this is some data showing. So the the um, the lines for the let's see if I have a pointer. I do. Um, so the red line here, um, the, these are um, the this, these are cell numbers. Um, so the the red line is sort of the baseline um, negative control, where it's just basically a basal medium, and you can see there's a dose dependent effect on proliferation um, all the way up to the positive control, which is a, a serum supplemented special medium that causes a lot of proliferation. Um, same thing, so this is adipose derived stem cells, these are mesenchymal stem cells, um, and this is again umbilical cord and showing that um, you do get quite a bit of proliferation from, in a, in a somewhat dose dependent manner from, um, from exposure to this tissue. And then in, in this one, um, the, we actually do these scratch tests where you take human dermal fibroblasts and you make, create, create a confluent um, layer and then there's a, a scratch wound, a special wound creator that you will make a, a, a calibrated scratch wound, and then you measure how quickly that comes back together, and it's sort of a wound healing model in vitro, if you will. And um, so this is the, uh, oops, wrong one, sorry. Back, 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 back. Um, there we go. This is um, the relative percent wound confluence, and this is the, again, the negative control, the positive control, and this is the extract. So it does actually also um, drive migration of cells. Um, and then this is, uh, when I talked about the placental disc, this is a product called Amniofil, um, and this is something that has the collagen-based disc scaffold with some of the amnion chorion and umbilical um, components added back in for some of these growth factors and, and regulatory proteins. Um, so it's, it's really a tissue matrix allograft. Um, it can be chopped up or kept as a sheet. Um, and there are multiple extracellular matrix proteins. There are, again, growth factors and cytokines and other specialty proteins that are in the bioactive placental tissue that enhances healing. And so you probably say, well, how do we know, um, you know where to use these? So we, we are, as I said, in very heavily into chronic wounds. I'll show you some data on that in a moment. Um, but also, um, there are a lot of other applications and indications for which these, could, these products could be appropriate, and we do have some data um, in some of those spaces. And in fact, amniotic membrane has been used in multiple indications for a number of years. So ophthalmology for treatment of um, scarring, corneal um, scarring, pterygium, chemical burns, and dental, um, dental treatments for uh, gingival recession, and also even for putting up into um, implant sites to increase bone, um, the bone integration. Uh, and then diabetic foot ulcers, um, these are... It, this, uh, this product, I haven't been with the company that long, and I have to say I've been shocked at how well these um, chronic, chronic diabetic foot ulcers that are going to amputation heal with these products is pretty amazing. Um, and venous leg ulcers, we have some data in that, too, in some randomized controlled trials that I'll show you the results of. Um, 
so this is kind of where the, the, the teeth were cut, so to speak, on, um, I don't know, these are gross, um, or really in, in venous leg ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers is where the, um, the beginnings of, of the excitement around these products has really um, taken off. So um, the studies that have been done um, internally that are level one evidence, I've summarized here. So there are a number of um, diabetic foot ulcers, ran randomized control studies, um, one had a complete wound closure, was 92% at six weeks. Uh, there was a crossover study that had complete wound closure, 91% at 12 weeks. Um, there was also, in, in diabetic foot ulcers, long-term follow-up, 94% re remained healed nine to 12 months after the initial closure. Um, in a study, a randomized, these are all randomized controlled trials versus the standard of care. Um, in one that showed weekly versus biweekly application of, of the product, the overall complete wound closure was 92%, 92.5% healing in 12 weeks, and the mean time with weekly was two and a, about two and a half weeks, and biweekly it took four weeks, which is interesting. Um, we don't really understand a lot about dosing yet in this, in this product category, but um, it's interesting that it's not always that more is better, um, it's that there is a balance there. So it, it's... Um, that study helped to highlight that. And then there was, there was a comparative study with a, a competitor product, um, both versus standard of care, that showed complete wound closure of 85% at four weeks and 95% at six weeks. So you can see that um, versus standard of care, it's, um, it's doing pretty well. Uh, venous leg ulcer, there was a surrogate marker study and also a multi-center randomized control trial. And you can see that um, uh, there was complete wound closure at 60% at 12 weeks and 71% at 16 weeks. And those have all been published. Um, so I'll go through those in a little bit more detail for those of you who are interested. Um, this is a very recently published in 2018. I think it came out in January, um, not, not too long ago this year. Um, it, it's a 14-site, multi-center study, randomized controlled trial versus the standard of care for um, non-healing diabetic foot ulcers. So these were chronic um, and, and weren't healing, and many of these people were actually headed to amputation. Um, they were randomized one-to-one -one in the intent to treat. There were 110 patients, um, 54 epifix. In the PER protocol, there were 98 and 47 of those were epifix. So obviously, the balance were the control. Um, group one was the treatment of epifix versus the standard of care. And group two was just standard of care, which, as you can see, is basically sharp debridement, standard wound dressings, um, other offloading devices, and, and et cetera. Um, and the primary endpoint was the incidence of complete wound closure assessed over a 12-week period. This was 110 patients in 14 wound clinics. So as you can see, Epifix demonstrated um, superior uh, DFU healing at 12 weeks. So in the intent to treat population, it was significant um, difference between 70% versus 50% of the standard of care, and in the per protocol, 81 versus 55%. Um, this is uh, um, umbilical cord, so epicord, so that was epifix, the, um, the amniotic, amnion chorion sheets. Um, this is, is looking also at um, epicord versus standard of care, and these were patients that were um, randomized two to one, and the intent to treat were 155, and in the per protocol were 134 total. The run-in period had some weekly wound cleansing, sharp debridement, and wound measurements. If patients had a wound reduction um, less than or equal to 30%, after two weeks of standard of care, they were allowed to enter the treatment phase. Um, so you'll see, when I show you some of the, the, the ensuing data, that debridement becomes very, very important in these studies. And you can actually get a long way with just debridement. I used to work at Genzyme for many years, and we had tried to do um, anti-TGF beta for, um, or TGF beta for, to try to heal some of these um, these things, and what we found was that if you did really good standard of care, that you, it was really difficult to to do better than that. And, and actually, I was really surprised when I joined Memetics that how well that their product did over standard of care. Um, so again, Epicord plus standard of care versus um, Alginate plus standard of care were the two treatment arms, and the incidence of complete wound closures assessed over 12 weeks. Um, and again, um, Epicord demonstrated superior diabetic foot ulcer. Uh, healing at 12 weeks, so 70 versus 48 percent in the intent to treat, 81 versus 54 in the per protocol. But interestingly, on the right is the intent to treat with adequate debridement. So that same group over on the left, all the way on the left, over on the right, shown with adequate debridement because these are done. Uh, we get to see how they debride because there's like a camera that captures all of the procedure. Um, so you can go back and find out um, post hoc which ones were adequately debrided, and you can see that you get a much better result, 96 um, percent. Um, with adequate debridement. 
So then um, we have a 16-site venous leg ulcer randomized control trial, and that's to compare again versus um, the standard of care, randomized one-to-one -one with the intent to treat being uh, 128 with 64 per arm, and the per protocol 109 with 52 Epifix and 57 control. And this is again back to the sheets, the amnion corian sheets. Um, so Epifix versus multilayer compression dressings were, was arm one, and just the dressings alone was the control. And this is time to complete ulcer healing. And at 12 and 16 weeks, um, the Epifix treated certainly did better, um, 60 versus 35 percent at 12 weeks, and 71 versus 44 at 16. And both of those are, are clearly significant. So some other um, interesting studies um, that we've been working on are in the ortho and sports med space. So um, one of the things that we need to do now for um, this, the product called um, AmnioFix injectable, um, it's a micronized product. And for those products, um, those are no longer going to be regulated as 361 products. They have to be regulated under 351. And thus, um, we've entered into um, three separate IND programs for three separate um, indications, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, and osteoarthritis. I'll show you a little bit more about the rationale for that. Um, so this was the phase 2B. Um, this is actually a little bit dated in that we have now published um, the long, this and the longer term data, but I think the point is made with this slide that um, if you have, so the, in the, uh, the Amnifix injectable treated group, and these are people who had chronic plantar fasciitis of at least a month duration, um, I think up to two years if I remember correctly, and this is just mean vast reduction um, in the in the um, Amnifix injectable group was 77% at three months and 85% versus 45 and 57 for the placebo group, and those were highly significant. So graphically, this data, so this is the saline, this is percent reduction from baseline of the pain. So at first, placebo works a little bit, and then it doesn't, um, whereas this, um, there's a continued trajectory with um, the Amnifix injectable, and at this point is where the, the subjects in the placebo group were allowed to undergo the alternative, and you can see that there's a migration um, toward uh, this type of response. Um, so interesting data, it's now um, in a phase three. Um, also Achilles tendonitis is in a phase three. Um, and then Amniofix for osteoarthritis has some rationale in that we have a number of um, clinicians who have been using this in osteoarthritis. This again is the Amniofix injectable, the micronized product. In um, Chris Alden's series, he's got more than 100 patients with symptomatic OA. This is a, obviously just a case series. He's used um, Amniofix injectable at 100 milligrams once intraarticularly and has really significant improvements. Don't have time to show all his data. Um, he does present this at various um, conferences. Uh, in both total and component CU scores, which is um, knee osteoarthritis outcome scores. That's um, a um, very common pain score, pain and function score to use for these studies. And then Alfred Gelhorn, who is at Weill Cornell, um, did, um, this is a published study, a case series, I should say, of 40 cases of sort of a, um, a batch study of chronic tendinosis or arthropathy, um, and 91% had clinically relevant pain relief at three months. So this at least gave some good reason to think that this might work well in, in osteoarthritis, and some preclinical studies in multiple um, occasions in rats collectively demonstrate an improvement in joint health and structure. So. Uh, joint health and cartilage structure. So it was reasonable to go forward into um, a study, and we're currently in a phase 2B um, with osteoarthritis. Ooh. I'm sorry, that didn't come out. Ah, I see. Um, sorry, I'm going to go through the, the animation. Um, so basically, um, going forward, this is, this is, these are some things that we've either done or will be doing. Um, you can see there the completed level one studies, many of which I've just gone through for you. Um, the ongoing level one studies include the three um, IND studies for uh, plantar fasciitis, osteoarthritis, and Achilles tendonitis. And the, um, you can see there there's a number of planned level one studies, and we've done some retrospective studies as well. So um, thank you very much for your time and attention.